This is the D6 Generation. Dice are our vice. Creating not too horrible content since 2008. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Oh, I think we're well past that. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the D6 Generation, and we are very excited, Rafe. Super excited. This is a this is a three pip pip. <laughs> yes, uh, right. because not only is Rafe here with me, and I'm here, but now we are super excited to have Matt Wilson from Privateer Press back in the virtual studio. Yep, live on Zoom. Uh, and Matt, welcome to the show. Can you believe this is your sixth appearance on the D6 Generation? What is that about? I, I can't even believe that it's been six times, but I, uh, but you know, I, at my age now, my memory is failing. Um, so I, I can't remember what happened last week. It's getting, I, well, the fun part we've been talking, our very, mass very first appearance in the D6 generation was all the way back in 2008. If you can believe Man, it. I can't believe it. Episode 14, Matt was kind enough. We're this little up and coming podcast, knowing who we were. And Matt was kind enough. I think you cornered him at Gen Con. Yep, we're like, we Matt, did. would you come on our show? And he was like, so kind to come on. So Matt, thank you for sticking with us all this time. We can't wait to, and by the way, if you're a listener out there and you're like, hey, I want to listen, I want to hear like Matt's origin story and how he started Private Air Press and all, that's back in episode 14. We talked yep. about all that then. Yep. It's still on the internet. Go check it out on our feed. You can listen all about that. Um, But we want to talk today with, with Mr. Wilson about the awesomeness that is War Machine 4th Edition. Yes. Matt, we blame you. We've been completely sucked back into your crazy game since fourth edition so so that's your fault all right mission accomplished then i feel like it um but rafe i know you had a question want to kick us off today with um go ahead yeah so matt knows i mean we sometimes stay in touch for like you know years past but russ and i are just giant fanboys of privateer pathways have been and big fans of you matt and i remember there was a period of time i don't remember how long ago but you had stepped away from from the helm of privateer press um, maybe the direct helm and you were pursuing some other pursuits. And then I was just curious with Mark four in that I read that letter, the creative director letter that you or email that you wrote. It was, no, it was a letter posted. It was, it was really great to see you back. And that really helped explain a lot. And I was like, Oh, does this mean Matt's more back at the helm or does he have a different role with his own company? And so that was my question. Yeah. It, I mean, there was a time there where, um, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of different people. We had experienced a lot of growth. Um, and I was looking to take, uh, you know, privateers properties, war machine and monster apocalypse into, uh, other directions. Um, and as well, I was, I was exploring and still am, um, uh, doing a lot of work in, um, film and other mediums. Um, <clears throat> so privateer has always been my, my core focus. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, even, even, during those times when I, I wasn't quite as hands-on with everything as I am right now. Um, but, uh, but I've also always had, you know, a lot of other things that, that I've followed up on, whether it was, uh, illustration work or writing, um, screenwriting, uh, filmmaking, we've had video game projects in the works and, and all kinds of different things that I've, I've sort of got my hands in some things that people know about some things that, uh, they don't know about some things that people will never know about. And uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, but I would say that, uh, you know, now, particularly with fourth edition, um, I'm, I'm much more involved in the day-to-day -day operations and hands-on than, you know, than I was say six or eight years ago. Um, and, and I don't want to give the impression that I was ever not part of privateer. Like I said, it was, it was always my mainstay it has been, since you know 23 24 years ago when we started it um but uh but at, at this point yeah I'm, you know it's we've got a smaller leaner team now um and so it uh it kind of is a situation where everybody's doing a lot of different things and it kind of has more of the feel of <clears throat> you know when we i think when we started um you know where it's it's a little scrappier and uh it's a little exploratory <clears throat> and experimental and trying new things um and and really you know having fun with it rather than it being sort of uh something that's kind of templated and you you know where you're going year after year now it's kind of um it's it's fun again to be 
you know, in this super creative space where every day we're, you know, tackling a new problem or we're coming up with a new idea or, um, you know, just, just really trying, trying to sort of keep having fun with something that we've been doing for 20 years. I can't believe it's even been that long. And yeah, that's a good point. I, I think I, I gave the impression that you stepped away. I more meant in my love, which was the miniature game part, portion of it. So thanks for clarifying that for our listeners. I think I'm hearing uh, since you and I last chatted, Matt, I, I'm now 100% do business coaching. I teach entrepreneurs and I'm kind of sounding, hearing that like, ooh, the entrepreneurialism of the company is back. And uh, and it sounds like you're excited about that. And I know Russ has a bunch of questions along along that front. So that's I mean, really exciting to hear. I might need to sign up for your for your course. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have you. Well, Matt, I think we'll it's, chat. It's obvious. The longer I go, the less equipped I feel I am for this job. So <laughs> that just means you know more. That's right. See, that's the it's thing. Wisdom. I think I found as I get older, I know, I know, I know how much less I know because I know how much more there is to know. I guess I don't, I don't even know how that works. Good point. Uh, but Matt, I, I you said something in there, and I, I don't ever want to imply that that Privateer wasn't cranking out great products because I've you know been with you guys for all the years, and and you have, but it definitely feels like with Fourth Edition, there's a there's a passion, there's an excitement, there's an yes. energy that's 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 back. Uh, and and let me ask you this because obviously. Um, you guys were super excited about fourth. There's obviously a crap ton of thought that went into this because, yes, uh, you know, I think a lot of people um, in my day job, I'm not a coach like Rafe is, but I'm a product manager. So I understand you you launch small and you build and you learn as you go. Um, and even though that sounds simple, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. And I'm watching how you guys are launching fourth. And I'm like, these guys have figured some interesting things out. Like there's a lot of cool stuff happening here that I'm not sure everybody fully appreciates. I'm like, that's really interesting. Uh, so I want to dive into all that. Like I'm super passionate. My business side's passionate. My gamer side's passionate. But I, let me ask you this first, Matt. Like with fourth, clearly you guys were like, let's just, what if we just kind of thought about blowing it all up? Like what happened? Like what were some of your goals in fourth? Like what sort of got you to that point where like, we want to think a little differently. We want to put some energy back. How did that thought process start? Uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, it, it definitely is. It... Fourth edition has probably been the biggest challenge that we ever took on. And part of the reason is that um, it's a, you know, with War Machine, it's a product line that's been around for uh, quite a while, you know, three generations, which generation nowadays, it can mean, you know, six years like it did for us, or it can mean two years, you know, if, for other games, right? They might go through editions uh, much faster. Um, <clears throat> so the number of editions isn't as important as I think the the fact that, the you know, we were we're 20 years old with War Machine this year. So that's a long time. Wow, um, that is a long time. And and we've we've definitely learned uh a lot along the way. You know, I know that um there's hardly any other companies out there that have ever made mistakes with products. Uh, <laughs> but we, you know, but we have. And um, and as much as I would like to say that we've got a, a an untarnished record, it's not it's not possible to go that long and you know just hit home runs every single time. Um, and, uh, and so with third edition, even though when we launched that product, we had, we had more time and more resources and more people involved and more of everything, um, you know, than, than we ever had previously when third edition launched and it had an incredible launch. Um, but the, there were, there were some things that were, I think, short-sighted in in the um, in our planning, it, more more in the way that we understood the the community and the audience, what people wanted out of the product. And then once we did stumble a little bit, um, we weren't fast enough to react. And I think that 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 had sort of a um, you know long-term effects on. The health of the community and the interest and um, and people's confidence in in what we were doing, um, and you know there, there was never any lack of effort on our side to try and make everything work and make it right. But sometimes you know when you 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 hit a speed bump and uh, and too many folks fall out of the back of the truck and <laughs> you can, <laughs> right, it gets hard to correct. You yeah. just turn around and you know pick them back up. So. A new addition is a is a new opportunity for us to sort of apply those lessons, um, you know, from third edition, but all the way back to the to the beginning, 
and um, and really try and uh, reshape the game and and more than the game, but the the experience with it um, for what I think is a is a, a very different audience um, than we had when we first started. And that's not to say that the people are necessarily different. We have people that have been playing with us, you know, playing War Machine since first edition for 20 years, right? And then we've got players that that have come in last year. But even now I know that um, you know, I'm I'm not the same guy I was 20 years ago. I don't like to play the games the same way that I like to play them 20 years ago. And I think that <clears throat> we've seen uh growth and evolution in in the the people that we started with um and just the 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 um game audience at large these days and and it you have to keep evolving with the times and so um that has informed a lot of our approach to the to fourth edition you know everything from um the way we produce the game to the way we publish the the rules and content around it to the types of content that we're putting into it um and uh and just just everything about our approach so you know i'm sure we'll dive into to each of those subjects but i would say you know more than anything this is fourth edition is um the the most thought out version of of war machine that we've ever done, you know, and, and when, when we started 20 years ago, it was, um, it was fun and, uh, novel. We hadn't done anything like it and everything was new and we made something that we thought, you know, that we loved and we hoped that other people would love. And then with the second edition, I think we were, you know, it, we're five years into it and we're like, what the hell do we do? Cause we didn't ever really have a plan. And how do we, how do we keep this going? Right. Like how, how do we, you know, make sure that war machine isn't just sort of a one-off, but this is, you know, we feel like there's a lot more that we want to do with it. And um, you know, clearly it has momentum and, and, and there's more that people want from it. So what do we do next? And, and so the, the second edition mark two is really almost a um it was just how do we one up that thing that we did before what's what's the next thing we can do how do we keep um impressing you know our our players and third edition came around and and i think that there was a point at which we were kind of like we got this you know and um and that's when you hit the speed bump so yeah yeah overconfidence always gets you yeah Uh, but but I think one one thing I'll say, Matt, and I, I know you um, you kind of hinted at it um, was just sort of the passion for the game, and it's been interesting to Rafe and I. Uh, you know, when we when we saw you guys were coming out with fourth, we're like, well, we got to break our models out again. We got to play it, and we and we were playing War Machine and off. And Rafe and I always have a joke. We always bet each other how many games of War Machine we'll play each year. So we've we've never left the family, but it's just is it the first game we grab off the shelf? And when fourth came out, uh, so we played it a couple times, and we're like. Ooh, there's something here. Mm-hmm. And then what surprised me was something you hinted at, Matt, which was when we started talking about it on the show, we've had the most reaction and most engagement in a long time to a game. I think you've got a group of people out there, a large fan base who is hungry for War Machine to 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 do some of the things you guys are doing. And everybody's excited and interested to hear about it. And there's still a lot of passion out there. So I think this is this is one of the reasons Rafe and I get excited and, and I think our listeners are getting excited and I'm sure there's a tons of gamers out there that are excited. So, uh, you know, I can't wait to dive into more about some of the details we, you just kind of hinted at. I think, yeah, like I'm thinking back to when you launched prime, like Russ and I and other gamers listen to this. And even, even if they're new to the hobby, we're old enough to remember, like, you know, there was only GW in our little sphere. I know there's other games for other people, but when prime came along, we're like, Ooh, this is different. Like something's different happening here. And it's, it's being run by like a person named Matt Wilson and he's an artist and he's got this game in his mind and he created this whole universe for us. And that was just super fun. And it, it reminds me of that again, you know, like I'm like, Oh, okay. There's instead of just a ah, second edition with some, some tweaks and third with some tweaks, like it reminds me of like prime or something like there's, there's something new happening, which is exciting. I mean, we're definitely, definitely trying to make it, um, you know, to, to make it feel new, right. Without, 
also abandoning what it was. And I think that, you know, when you, when you get down into the, you know, the, the mechanics of the game, it's still war machine, right? It's yes. still, still feels like war machine. You know, maybe we yes. treat, you know, the movement of units different or we've added customization or something like that, but it's like at its core, the, the, um, you know, what makes War Machine War Machine has never wavered from edition to edition. You know, we didn't throw out the dice mechanic and, you know, revamp something just for the sake of calling it a new edition. We've always treated edition changes as uh, an opportunity to evolve and, you know, fine tune the game and make it better, file off those those friction points that you might discover, you know, after three or four years of, of playing an edition. But um, at the same time, we needed to make uh mark for a, a a great new entry point so whether you are somebody who is uh you know a 20 year old veteran of the game or you're brand new we wanted you to be able to step into mark four and not feel lost and that was that was a big part of our lesson with mark three you know i mean with mark three it wasn't the the stumbling blocks weren't rules related necessarily. I mean, there was some balance issues and things like that, but those all got addressed over time. It was, it, it was more of a, <laughs> it was, it was almost more existential, right. About what do people want from the game or what, you know, what is it that attracts people to a game and does war machine offer that? And, and one of the biggest problem that we addressed in Mark IV and, and, you know, and we're still sort of navigating our way through it is that War Machine is a massive game. The world is huge, but, but the game is almost, you know, it's just as huge. There's thousands of different models in the the back catalog. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it can be an extremely daunting, intimidating experience for somebody to step into for the first time. And it can also be daunting and intimidating for people who have played it for a long time, but maybe aren't like, you know, hyper focused on knowing every single little detail so that they can stay competitive. And, and that's, that's sort of um, what we've tried to move away from in, in Mark four is making it an experience that is more uh, accessible to somebody who is brand new or plays casually, but also still is just as rewarding to somebody who, you know, is you wants to be immersed in it all the time. And part of that is thinning out the catalog, which is, you know, I know that it sounds weird because we are releasing new armies at the same time that we're, you know, rotating uh, older models out of, out of, you know, the prime arena we have to make new stuff, right? Like we have to constantly make new product in order for the business to, to, uh, to exist. And I think sometimes people sort of forget that. I see the response from people like, you know, you, where, where they feel like we're sort of talking out of both sides of our mouth saying, you know, well, you're, you're making models obsolete, but at the same time, you're, you know, you're releasing new stuff. Why yes. do you have to make new stuff? And it's like, well, <laughs> Right. <laughs> we have to, right? We have to, and we have to make that space, right? In yeah. order to, you know, it's it's like it's like forestry, right? Where you got to clear trees in order to make Plant room new, ones. new trees to grow, right? And yeah. and otherwise, your forest dies, right? It gets overcrowded and stifled and dies. And I think that is a metaphor that I just stumbled on this moment. So I hope it holds up. But that's well, really I wanted to ask you. I think that's that, that's a great analogy, Matt. And I. And I, I've seen, like, I think that it helps me understand, and I, I like it, the the changing of from factions to essentially army lists, and those army lists have much a, a more inter- still very interesting and, and very exciting to look at, but it's a lot less intimidating, right? It's three warcasters in an army list instead of maybe ten or twenty or whatever it is, you know, under Mark Three, and so it's all of a sudden, whoa, what, I have three guys to choose from. That's a lot. I, I feel like I have a lot of choice, but it's still only three as opposed to a lot. Um, and and I and Rafe and I've talked about this. You did definitely manage to keep it feeling like War Machine, right? Like it yes. still feels like War Machine to us. And so let me ask you sort of a double-ended question, which is, uh, as you guys are thinking through these changes, uh, I, I can only imagine what it was like in that room to try to figure out, okay, what's what what's the core of War Machine? What's what's what are things we can cut? 
Um, what was the hardest change for you guys to kind of fail through? And then what's your proudest change? Like of the, it's kind of a double-edged side. What, what are you really happy with? And what was like the hardest decision to make? Like, ah, oh, can we, can we really get rid of facing or whatever it was? Like, what was the hardest choice there on that one? I mean, on the, on the sort of individual rules sides, there's things that, you know, we went back and forth on something like, you know, facing was an easy one. Cause yeah. it, it was like, I, I think, um, you know, to step back I, when we got, when we originally made war machine, and I think this is sort of a thing, you know, for maybe first time game designers, right. Is like, you're trying to create all these mechanics that sort of simulate this, uh, this experience of combat and you're trying to make it as visceral as possible. At least that's, you know, that was our approach. It was like, we, I, and I think something that we are kind of known for is we, we've really tried to make put a lot of effort into creating rules that sort of reflect that idea of what you're doing in the game. And, you know, so the, that it makes the experience more immersive, but over time we, we conceded certain things because it made the game experience better, even though it, it got further away from a simulation and, you know, our new movement rules are, are that, and those can be very like, at, you know, for people who have played war machine for a long time, where you moved your models, you know, one by one, you know, measuring each one of them, measuring each charge vector, right? Like, and um, then all of a sudden now we move to this, uh, this movement, where you move one model and then you place everything else around it. And you're like, well, my guys just like move through a wall or, right. or like, like they're, you know, they're teleporting and, and yeah, but no. Right. Like right. that's, mm -hmm. that's the abstraction that makes it a faster, better, more flexible game and not this rigid simulation that, you know, while some people do enjoy going through that, those, those sort of like more difficult trigonometry exercises of <laughs> platting out their, their attack vectors, it's, it doesn't make a great game experience for most, for more people. Right. And, and so that's really what, where we've tried to, you know, with, with the game rules, I think that um, the movement is still going to be one of those things that is, is contentious, but the, like, since we, released the the beta rules back in you know right before gen con last year um you know and and there were some people who were great with it right away and other people were like oh i can't stand these every day every single day we see more people you know posting online or things like that about like oh i didn't like the movement rules but i've come around to it and now i love them right mm -hmm. and like i totally get that so yeah. i would say that was you know you know to answer your question right that that was kind of column A and column B, right? That was one of the hardest things for us to, to, um, to, to change about the game because it also has a lot of, of interconnectivity in the game rules that it's, you know, it's not, we didn't just change how you move a unit. Like there's ramifications throughout the game that, and I'll be honest, we're still sorting those out, right? Like right. we've got um, an update that's going to, come out in the next week or two that will clarify some things that have caused a little bit of confusion around that. And it's in, in that for us, that's part of the process is game design is, is evolutionary, not absolute rare. And, and I, and the, one of the best things about the Mark four is because it is a hundred percent digitally um, published, we have the ability to, make those clarifications, adjust language a little bit to help people along the way, you know, the same way that um, a, a an online video game can hot fix right. you know, issues in their code, right? We have that same sort of ability now to, to do that and not make your book or your cards or something obsolete. Um, was that a tough decision, Matt? Because I, I love that. So I, I've always thought Privateer was ahead of the curve on War Room. Like that whole model was interesting, but even back then you still had decks of cards, right? So it was still the option for people to play. And now you're just like, no, we're all in like the books, the fluff, the, the rules, like, like the rule book, the, the, the scenarios, like everything is digital. Everything's in that one place. It's in the app. Uh, and it is what it is. It must be liberating, but also have you, was it, was it challenging to go that route and kind of really think, was there any nervousness about like, we're going to go hundred percent digital or did war, war, war room give you confidence? Do you guys kind of know? 
our players are already living in War Room pretty much, even though we have the cards and we're feeling pretty good about this option. Well, we, we knew the vast majority of our players did use War Room when they played. Yeah. So so we did have that that level of confidence. But also, I think that, that more um, than anything, the experiencing the limitations of print over, you know, the previous six years yeah. is what gave me the confidence to know. And I know, you know, not everybody was with me um, as we, as we moved into this. And I think our, you know, our team is still getting used to the idea of, of that we're, that we're no longer under those limitations. One of the, the biggest things there was, you know, as we, as we made this determination, and getting into War Room and starting to like develop the, no, I'm sorry, the War Machine app. Um, as we started to develop it and realizing, like, for better or for worse, and I'm sure it's, it truly it's for better, but there there is a a, a dark side to it. Is mm-hmm. we we don't have a space limitation that cards give you anymore, mm-hmm. and that was always something that we kind of you know wrestled with since the beginning, because as we wanted to do more interesting and complex things on cards, you know, we still had a finite amount of space that we could work with it. And then at some point right. we decided, well, well, what if we just use two cards? And then all of a sudden Warcasters have, you know, additional cards to make up their, you know, all their rules and everything. And, you know, or we, the, the other end of the spectrum is why don't we compress it down to three point type, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No one will have a problem reading that, right? And <laughs> and that's, you know, so those limitations can sometimes be um good things if you are able to work within them, right? Cuz they'll they, you know, they, you know, they'll keep you from doing things like overriding rules that um that became too lengthy or too complex. So now we don't have that, right? Because we can make paragraphs as long as we want and and the you know the cards don't constrain the space anymore and i wouldn't say that that has allowed us to run away with the rules because we're still fairly like we're still trying to make things easier and simpler but um at the same time working in that digital space we were able to nest all of the rules on a card mm-hmm. so it's not like you yeah. open up a card and what you see is a giant card you have you know little tabs that um that one second. Sorry, I need to have this one out. But Micro's done. <laughs> what are you eating, Matt? Any good thing good for dinner? <laughs> I don't even know what it is. I just I just hung the phone. Um, so uh, now with the cards, though, as I was saying, you you've got these. You know, you've got the tabs. So the information's there at your fingertips, yep. but it's not in your way. So yeah. you don't have to like comb through paragraphs of rules. You just click on the you know the rule with the name that you want the, and it opens up and it's right there, you know, or you go to mark damage and you click the, the damage tab and bam, you can enter in your damage. So right there. Well, you also made the user experience better in general. Cause Rafe and I just noticed the other day, the, the new question mark option, which lets you see the definition of all the icons in a section of the card too, which now makes it better than a card experience. Right. Because yeah, the, yes. one of the things you guys did in the past was come up with icons to save card space, but now I got to go look the icons up, especially as back to accessibility and easy to use. And yeah. now I can just click it. Not only does it show me what the slam icon means slam, but now I got a link right to the slam rules that just expand right out. It's not even a, not even really a, a tap. So that's, uh, I'd say that's, that's one of the things it, it, to me, the new, and the new app is peppier, a little faster. So if, if folks out there try war room uh, and haven't tried the war machine app, it's a whole new app. Uh, and you can tell it was written from the ground up with, with a lot of interesting thinking in mind, particularly yes. around performance and ease of use. And it definitely achieved a lot of those things. And I like to where it, it does seem like you took a lot of care and attention, um, as a, for the players where you could say, Hey guys, we're going to, we're going to create some legacy abilities for you. And, and, and they're going to have new, new stats. So you, all your old armies are not all, but like some of the choices we pre-select in the app. To, to run the legacy models. And that I do think that's that nod for those people that have been with you for 20 years. And yet it's also fun to then think, Ooh, and then what are the new models that I can purchase and, and play with and, and have fun with. So I do, I, I for one, again, I'm biased because I'm, I'm a big privateer press fan. So I, I, I realize I'm biased to those listeners out there, but I felt like I felt that love as a gamer, you know, where you said, Hey guys, we're going to give you this opportunity and they're new. 
they're, they're new rules to the old mm-hmm. models, which is fun. And then there's these new models that we can also enjoy to help support the company and have the company grow too. So I, I think that is, I think that was done brilliantly personally. Thank you. We, we, we haven't spared any effort on, on the legacy models. In fact, I mean, if you, if, if you look at the amount of hours that have gone into uh, the new releases versus the conversions of the, you know, the back catalog to the new Mark IV rules, the the legacy effort is tenfold what the new effort is. I uh, think it shows. Like yeah. I, I know that these aren't just throwaway rules or throwaway yeah. catch up mechanics. Not at all to anybody listening who hasn't come back. No, yeah. we've put, we've put every you know all the same effort because I, I mean at the end of the day we're we we don't want anything to feel like it was. Uh, you know, not given the the time of day. And I mean, you know, and, and I think, you know, now we, we have a little bit of proof, right. We have in, in the, um, the competitive events at Adepticon this past week, and we mm-hmm. had uh, legacy models in the finals. So it's, they're not, yeah. um, it's, you know, they haven't been shortchanged. Uh, Let me the- ask you about that, Matt, since a uh, syringe brief jumped there and, and, and there's been some, uh, I don't know, Reef and I were talking about this. So in our, in our last episode about war machine, we ended up spending like most of the time, uh oh, debating yeah. amongst ourselves like <laughs> like what your guys go to market strategy on this is and and what the difference is so for listeners out there who might be confused like us because i think one of the things that is awesome is that your the app the war machine app shows sort of like you know when you go to build an army there's prime and then there's unlimited and then if you click on prime there's mark four and there's legacy right and then uh within there there's there's different armies you can choose from um so, uh, but to your point, what you just mentioned, I think is important for people. I think a lot of people look at legacy and they assume, well, that's not going to be tournament legal, but only the Mark IV is tournament legal. But um, so can you walk us through, like, what's the difference between unlimited prime Mark IV and prime legacy? Sure. Yeah. And now, you know, what what is tournament legal at the end of the day depends on the the person running the tournament, right? Sure. And, Good point. and that's, that's not something that we ever um, would would want to dictate but what we did for uh you know to try and achieve that goal of of making sure that mark four was accessible to new players and existing players and returning players is we in an effort not to completely abandon anything that we've created for people we separated uh or we i should say we created two different play arenas right there's the prime arena and the unlimited arena. And the prime arena is all the new content that is Mark four, right? Everything that's, that is introduced to the game from the the point that we launched Mark four forward in this edition, as well as a curated uh, limited amount of content from every faction that existed prior to Mark IV. And the, on, in general, what that means is every faction has two armies um, that are playable in, in it. Now, that's not in, that's not true for everything because there are certain armies or certain factions that were more contained, uh, like the Grimkin or the Crucible Guard, where we said, you know, they're, they're recent enough and they are also limited enough that 100% of those you know, of their, their models are going to be playable in the prime arena, but larger factions, you know, whether it was, uh, Cricks or Signar or, or, um, you know, these armies that are, factions that have been around for 20 years, right. And had hundreds and hundreds of models, you know, dozens of warcasters or warlocks. We, we basically created, uh, two armies within each of those around their dominant themes and made sure that those armies have, lots of uh options as well each one of those armies has multiple war casters and troops and war jacks or war beasts or whatever and so you can you know there's lots of space in there to customize your your army the way you could before it's just you can't play everything together and those armies are independent of each other as well because that's a big concept of of mark IV's keeping the is is you don't play a faction anymore. You play an army, right? And that army has is is somewhat uh, contained. I'm kind of contained, kind of in air quotes, right? Like <laughs> it's it's not. It doesn't mean that we will never make new content for it, but we're not going to perpetually expand these armies 
the way many of the the factions were historically for War Machine, where every year there was new content that came out for, you know, for... All. Does that mean like, so like the Signar Storm Legion, right? So like the, am I saying the right name? I was getting, because it's, it's, yes, Storm Legion. Yes, yeah. The Storm yeah. Legion is the new prime Mark IV Signar Force at the moment, right? right? And and it, it looks like you guys really thought carefully about accessibility, as you mentioned. Like the, the number of models in there is reasonable. Still, there's still a lot of freaking choices in there because your jacks are. And we talked about our in the show before, like how the cut jacks are customizable, and there's spell racks and all kinds of cool stuff you can do. So there's a lot of customization in there. Not a, you know amongst all the other things you can pick, but it also means uh, uh, everything else for Signar would either be in. Uh, oh, and it also you're kind of controlling it. Like so, there's the base box for that. So it sounds like you guys are also thinking about the SKUs, right? Like how much shelf space is going to take mm-hmm. up at a store. So you got the base box and then there's like one small army expansion box for that. And then there's a couple of single boxes. Uh, and then if someone wanted more different Signar stuff, that would probably someday come out as a different Signar net new army, right? It wouldn't, you wouldn't probably blow out the Storm Legion more. Is that what you're yeah, saying? So I'll, let, me, and let me go into that a little deeper too, because one thing that is, that I know can be confusing, especially for anybody stepping into this for the first time, and especially if they have experience with War Machine, is there are some factions that exist both as in in Legacy and in Mark IV, right? But those armies are not compatible. So the the Storm Legion is not compatible with the uh, the first army, right? The first army being the uh, a legacy army, and Storm Legion being the new Mark IV. Those those armies, while they exist under the same umbrella as Signar, they don't have any crossover. And and there's a hard line between Mark IV models and legacy models that the where they can't exist in the same army, except for the places that we're going to break those rules in the future, which will happen. But that's that that's uh that's down the road Mm -hmm. um now what the way we will expand uh things in the future in mark four let's take the storm legion for example um they are relatively do what i did there rafe i'm talking about my army yeah Yeah, let's take the storm legion (laughs) as an example it's let's not talk about kador no one cares about them it's it's a it's a good one because it's um there's a lot that people already know about it right so the, the Storm Legion is relatively contained and it and it has about it'll have uh six or seven skews. Um and skew count is something that we were very, very cognizant of because one of the challenges over the past six or eight years, as as our, our industry overall has become more and more impacted with product, it is incredibly difficult for retailers and uh distributors to stock games with lots of skews like right. Right. There was a day where you could walk into a store and it would be 20 feet of mm-hmm. War Machine cords, you know, blisters, hundreds, maybe thousands, right, on the walls. Yeah. If the store was full service, and that it, it doesn't exist anymore. You, no one can can do it, right? Um, and and so what we wanted to do was really reduce that footprint that the product has, um, you know, on a on an army to army basis, so that retailers could decide, you know, if, if they are just going to carry the starters so that they can bring new people into the game, if they want to be full service, right. And make sure that they have everything available for an army at any time, then that means they're carrying a starter, an expansion box, one a la carte warcaster and a solo Mm -hmm. and a couple of warjacks, right? Like that's the whole, that's everything that gives you all of your options for, that army. Now, um, within that, right, and not to make that sound too limited, right, you you still have three Warcasters and you've got lots of units and solos and you can create all kinds of different configurations for your army um, out of those options. But that's, that's your, that's your menu. Now, in sometime next year, we'll release the next Signar army, right? And right now, for the sake of example, we'll just call them the Gravediggers. And well, we could call them the gun mages, Rafe. I mean, well, not to lead you on, but uh, the gun mages were the first models they ever painted, and it would be really cool if there are king gun mages back in the game. I'm not trying to influence you in any way. Well, hang on, hang on, because be- we'll, let me get to the gun mages because okay. that's, that's oh. part of 
that's part of the spiel here, right? So okay, good. Go continue then, please. We've got we've got the grave diggers, the this you know this trencher army, right? Yeah, that have a similar scope of um, you know of content as the storm legion does, but the storm legion and the grave diggers they cannot work together, right? We can't combine them in the same army, the same force, even though they're both signar uh, armies, right? But we have another configuration of models called cadres and a cadre is a smaller group of of um, themed models like gun mages right where we don't have whole armies of gun mages running around but we've got small elite units and so a cadre will be maybe let's say six to ten models total Mm -hmm. and that's where your gun mages come in and the and the cadres within a faction can be used in a force with any army in that faction. Ooh, they're like they're like faction specific mercs sort of thing. Yeah, right. So That's your cool. gun mages can work with the storm legion, or they can work with the grave diggers, and mm-hmm. and so every every faction in that has new content in Mark IV will have multiple armies and multiple cadres, as well as um, uh, some other models that can basically uh, be used between armies, colossals and battle engines, for instance, right? Those oh, nice. are those are big purchases um, in when it comes to the models, and we want to make sure that you get the most mileage out of them. And so those, those uh, models will also be usable between armies under the same faction. That's and, awesome. Um, and so that, and it also gives you a bridge, right? So that when you're like, yeah. I'm a Signar player and I love my Storm Legion, but I also like my grunts over here with the, 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 the trenchers, right? Like right. Um, you've got a bridge, you've got some models that are going to work, you know, both ways for you. And, and what that does is it, 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 it multiplies the options that you have for those armies, but also it still keeps the armies relatively contained, which is a very good thing for us as game designers, right? To be able to continue to develop new and interesting things that keep your armies fresh without having to sort of like water it down or sterilize it because now this thing has to be compatible with 12 war casters, right? Like those kinds of things. When when you have- It must help with game balance, right? That you kind of know what a Storm Legion looks like most of the time as opposed to- when you when you introduce a model into a pool right. where it has you know the ability to interact um, uh, with with you know everything else in its in in this menu right the size of that menu will have a lot to do with what you can actually do with a, a new model and I'm probably I'm really mincing my words there but yeah I'm saying the bigger the pool is the harder it is to create new and interesting things yeah. because of those you know, all the different ways that it multiplies those interactions. Whereas keeping things more focused lets us like, I think have a lot more fun with what we can offer um, players in those armies. And then, and then as well, it also lets us, I think, touch on a lot more different themes um, mm-hmm. throughout the the setting that, that, you know, we might not get to if we have to just keep focusing on. Well, or, it also gives a really cool thematic, sort of it's interesting to even just the name like the signar legacy army is like the first army like you know something oh what that's like it's like the big red one like that's kind of cool you know so you start yeah. to you think about the fluff in the background of those sorts of things it just gets your creative juices flowing as a player i had a question on fluff too matt how does somebody catch up so to speak if they've been away for a while or they're new on what the old storyline or older storylines were to the current you don't. And that was, that's by design, right? Okay. We, so with Mark four, we, we went into it um, with, we, we put a big time jump in between sort of where we left off the storyline in the Mark three era and where we take up um, this new storyline of Mark four. Oh, so neat. You, if you get into the game now and you start reading the, the lore or any of the fiction you don't have to know anything that that existed before to sort of understand the state of the world. To That's know who cool. characters are, we wanted it to be a a brand new starting point, and so the whole storyline sort of is. I mean, it, it really st- kicks off with the the 
the new Orgoth invasion. Now, of course, I, it's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself because who are the Orgoth? They are these guys from, you know, 800 years ago that, that conquered the Iron Kingdoms. And that's, uh, that's all in the history of the setting. But that stuff we catch you up on really fast, right? Like you're going to understand who the Orgoth are very quickly, how, why that's significant that they've returned to the, to the Iron Kingdoms. But like all the Warcasters, um, you know, it's an all new pantheon of characters. We have a few uh, returning characters. There's a couple of Mercs that are, you know, longtime um, stars of the setting, Eris and, and uh, Alexia. And we did want to have, you know, feel like they're, we have those ties, but they're not, they're not drivers necessarily of the storyline. And, and so I don't think somebody coming into the, the setting for the first time isn't going to encounter them and suddenly feel lost. Like they don't know who these characters are. And in I that, think that's really helpful. Um, Cause I know like Russ was saying like his favorite cast or strikers like dead now. And I'm like, wait, when did that, well, he happen? was dead at the end of Mark three though. We oh, okay. So I just missed that A decision but... that I, I have issues with Matt. I'm not going to lie, but you know, <laughs> these things happen. Uh, we can listen. unpack that. You know, another time. But, <laughs> yeah. but that's so you know, coming, coming in, they don't right. have to feel like they have to catch up. So that's just right. good to know. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and then, you know, another thing, and this is something that, that over since the beginning of War Machine, the storyline's always been very important to us. We mm-hmm. love telling the story of the setting of the characters, and and we have moved aggressively moved that storyline forward. You know, every year, every with every new publication, yeah. and and then through myriad other novels and you know short fiction in magazines and published online and all over the place, and um, we often get uh, requests to like, hey collect this into a giant omnibus. And we've actually tried to do it twice where we literally made it a huge project to try and like bring all this all stuff together into, into one volume in, you know, or multiple volumes that, that could be, uh, you know, read through cohesively. And it, it, it couldn't, it didn't work. Like we literally would get into the project and say, we just can't make this work in a way that's ever going to be satisfying for anybody. Mm-hmm. And so that was, a big part of the reason for us wanting this new starting point, Mark four. So now you, you, you go to the app, right. And you open the library and you go to the fiction, right. And there's our first storyline, you know, it's a serialized fiction every month. There's a new installment of it. And um, you know, and then all of the lore documents are there for. It's great. I've been watching. I love watching that come out. Like when my, cause I jumped in the app almost as soon as you guys launched it. And it was fun to just see the high level lore, but then you had the faction specific stuff, which yeah, is fun. That is fun. And so it's clear. And and one thing, just kind of come back to the list really quick, because I think it's all tied together a little bit. So when we were talking about, uh, you know, you go into the, to the app for a minute, and so you're going to build a list and you can choose Prime Legacy or Prime Mark IV. The only models you're ever going to see in there are A, models that either if it's the Mark IV, it's the new stuff. So it's everything that's been basically produced since 2022 two going forward, I guess yep. is a good way to say it. And then the legacy stuff is anything that is balanced from the older models, but is still alive. So you would never see striker in legacy because he's dead, but you might see Cray in legacy, which you do because he's still around. But then you also have this other playability, which is unlimited. And it's a little confusing now for maybe a new player to go in because the, everything that's unlimited is also in legacy and Mark four. But eventually my understanding, right. Is that everything that was ever produced would be in legacy. So if I wanted to play an old school game with Ray, I mean, unlimited, if I wanted to play an old school game with Vlad versus striker, for example, I could play unlimited, right? Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, absolutely. That's by, by the end of this year. Um, and, and probably well before it, we will have converted every legacy model, uh, will have rules in the unlimited arena. So, um, so if, if you want to wade into that arena where, you know, to, to really have a full knowledge of it, you need to understand thousands of models, right. Uh, they, they will all have their rules. Right. So yeah, you can play that, that old school game. It, I don't, it, it won't be the most common way to play. Right. Because yeah. I, you know, anybody who is um, running a competitive format or, or anything and is interested in maintaining, you know, uh, a healthy growing community is going to realize that, that having a, a more limited arena is a healthier thing for 
that that sort of competition play. I think that's right. It makes a lot of sense. I I just think I I really appreciate you guys are going through all the time to update the rules so I can play those old models. And you've basically created war machine historicals (laughs) because now, and because I think you guys pretty much said pretty clearly too, correct me if I'm wrong, like unlimited, by the way, may not be the most balanced experience, right? We're not really too concerned about making sure it's balanced because one of the reasons by, by limiting some of this stuff, it lets us be more balanced. So just word of caution, it's probably not super balanced, but if you want to have a nice fun time, you know, have a few nice drinks and, and, and relive the old days, you can certainly do that. Yeah. Yeah. It it won't be, it won't be as, as buttoned up as, uh, as the, the prime arena, right. Um, you know, everything is getting play tested and we're certainly doing our best as we, as we do these conversions, but it is, it is not possible, practical, and I want to say possible again. To, to <laughs> no, but I appreciate you guys are putting the time in because I, I, I just, I really do it. Oh, so Matt, I know we're getting close on time, and I want to give Rafe another question, but um, I, I did want to ask you this. So, you guys are innovating in a couple of really interesting ways. I think it's really worth worth noting. Um, one, of course, is going fully digital. Mm-hmm. I can't think of another miniature game that's fully digital right now. At least no. not a mainstream one. I'm sure there's some small ones somewhere, but. Um, so that's really fascinating, especially in this day and age when there's miniature games on every corner. You can't, and that's one of the reasons the skew limiting is pretty smart because part of the problem is stores have so many to carry now. It's just not, you know, you don't see the GW all that big either. You just can't, you just can't fill it out. Yeah. Um, but the other place you guys are in, innovating, which is really interesting, is you've moved a hundred, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, you moved a hundred percent to 3D printing now for your production of your models. Tell me about that whole thinking process and what do you think that enables you guys to do? Yeah, that's um, almost hundred percent, but definitely by the, by the end of this year, it will, it will definitely be. um, So no more spin casting, no more giant, super expensive plastic molds. This is like, everything's just a fancy 3d printer in Matt's basement. Yeah. yeah, I wish wish it was in my basement. (laughs) We have a a big expensive space that we're paying for every month, but, uh, but yeah, it is, it is all um, about the 3D production now. And so the the way we got there was, um, you know, I, it's, it's so uh, it's so 2022 to talk about the pandemic anymore. Right. But <laughs> um, that's really, you know, a big part of getting through that, going through that and um, and watching the world change everything from the supply chain disruptions. Yeah overseas production to the rising cost in materials, you know, and, um, and I've, even before the pandemic, this was an issue for us, but when we got into producing uh, metal models back in 2003, we used to pay $3 and 25 cents a pound for metal. And over, you know, a decade or so, by the time we got to about 2013, 2015, we were paying over thirteen dollars a pound for it. Wow, and that's a that's, that's a huge, yeah. uh, um, you know, increase to our cost of goods, our materials costs, and um, and it and it's I'm not sure where it was at at this point, but I know it went up even further um, during the you know the the sort of pandemic woes. Now at the at the same time, we've seen labor go up, you know, double. Yeah beyond and um and you know and we we want to try and you know stay as as competitive there as we can as well so the rising costs of of everything um were a huge factor in us trying to figure out where do we go next and there there aren't too many options when it comes to making miniatures but you know the the two that we've used three that we've used over uh historically have been the cast metal, the cast resin, and um, and then overseas production, and you know there's multiple types of uh, plastics productions, and we've experienced all of them. Um, but uh, but those those are are sort of your options. And then 3D printing came along, and we'd been watching it for years. We've been using it for years in our own in our production processes as. as um, for mock-ups and stuff, right? Well, yeah. for making our, our masters, right? Yeah, so right. we would, you know, as we moved into, as we moved from traditional sculpting into digital sculpting and um, and everything, you know, had to be printed out so that we could create a physical mold from it. Um, you know, we've, we've 
I don't know how many years, but for quite a while, right? We've made, you know, all of our, all of the original masters, right? What would have been the original sculpts back when they were done traditionally by hand have been 3D printed and we make the molds from those. Um, so we had experience there, but, and, and we've been watching, you know, carefully over the years at how the, um, the technology was changing and becoming more accessible and becoming more possible to produce at scale, you know, at, at the kind of commercial volume that we would need to. And, and there's trade-offs like it's, you know, it's a, it is a, it's not a silver bullet when it comes to production, because there's certain things that, um, the, it can do better and certain things that it doesn't do as well. You know, I mean, if it, when it comes down to speed and, and labor costs, metal production is still by far the fastest, right? Like we can wow. create metal oh. pieces super hmm. fast, but there, there are, uh, you know, there are other expenses like the molds um, that yeah. have to be made. And, and then of course the unpredictability or the volatility rather of the, um, the materials costs that we have to deal with. Resin, uh, poured resin, right, is a lot more stable when it comes to the materials cost, and the material itself isn't particularly is is well, it's far less expensive than metal, which is why we've, you know, years ago when we started um, making the larger, the the really big pieces in resin, it was because we could make those things and still keep them relatively affordable, um, even though the volume of material was was pretty significant, but on the, the labor side, it's incredibly slow. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, it takes a long time to, to set those up and pour each one. The molds don't last very long. They burn out really fast. So we're constantly remaking molds, which are expensive. Um, and, uh, and so, so, you know, we, we sort of balanced our, our costs and effort and labor and everything between metal and resin over the past many years. But then, we got to this point during the pandemic where we said metal is just no longer feasible. It's not something that um, is sustainable because the cost, we can't predict where it's going to go. And by, you know, every indicator, it was just going to keep going up. If not like, you know, and there's also the possibility that it might just one day not even be there. Like you, you might not be right. able to easily because somebody else is eating it all up, you know, right. and what people don't know is like tin all comes from one mine, right? Like it's right. not, there's lots of places that this stuff comes from back when we started, there was a mine in Brazil and there was a mine in China, I think, you know, like two places. And I'm, I'm probably not exactly right about those two places, but it was something like that. Right. And then the one in Brazil closed. And that's part of what caused the, um, the cost to start rising, you know, after several years that we were in this. And it was like, we're at the mercy of one, you know, one place, one place that digs the stuff out of the ground. Right. And, Interesting. And, um, yeah. Eventually it gets to, to the material that we're making. So we needed a better solution long-term and the, the technology for 3d printing was becoming more accessible. The materials are becoming more resilient and the one thing that we can count on 100% is that it's going to get better every year, right? Yeah. This technology, we've been watching it, you know, now for years, every every 6 to 12 months is like a generational Huge change leap, right? In, in the tech. And so the machines that we're using right now, we know that as they burn out, you know, in the next year or two, we're going to be replacing them with better machines that are going to Right. provide better quality faster higher resolution matt does it help you does it also make it easier for you guys to distribute models out of new locations is it, is it easier to set up a manufacturing facility that basically cranks out 3d printed stuff somewhere like in let's say europe or someplace or does that that really is that's part of the long-term yeah. strategy for this is that yes we, it will allow us to localize uh, production in different regions so that we can uh, not have to ship stuff around the world because that is a big super well shipping costs are up for everybody so yeah anything you can do to lower shipping costs to the users so yeah and that that is that's absolutely the the long-term goal that is very easy to state as a long-term goal right there's a lot <laughs> between here and there it's a lot harder to put that plan into action because at the end of the day right you can you can have a 3D printer farm delivered tomorrow, but yeah. you got to have the people to run it. And this is where people don't understand 3D printing because everybody who has ever been near a 3D printer is an expert about 3D printing. Right. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners now going, I can run that for Matt in my basement. They, yeah. they all know exactly yeah, how it works. <laughs> and we get lots of advice on a daily basis, which is great. But, <laughs> um, but the reality with 3D printing production is it's not a push button process. You don't just like load your file on and bam, out comes, you know, perfect models. It is still an incredibly labor intensive process because the it's just that instead of that labor being on the front end, as it was when we were doing traditional cast uh, miniatures, you know, where it's you, you go through, you make your masters and then you make master molds and then you make production uh, masters and you make production molds and then somebody spins all those, you know, and eventually you have piles of miniatures piling up. And after that, they just kind of get packed into the packaging. But with 3D printing, it's it's kind of in reverse. You, you, you do plug your file into the printer and away it goes. And then a few hours later, you come back and you take your models off the plate and then you clean the printer. And then the models go through a an extensive um, rinsing and washing and uh, post production curing process that that is that is multiple steps actually more steps in the overall like sequence of you know um, of beginning to end for a product than anything that we've done before but there there are certain advantages to well if we want to scale up it's just a matter of we can add more printers but that does mean that we may need more hands to take those off so it's um it it's for me it's been a pretty fascinating experience to to try to learn all of this and to understand the you know where where the um the human side of it is and where the automated side of it is and and how those things have to work together, but it's not as simple as what people think. You know, they have you he, found it all. I'm curious because um, I I I, uh, I blame you for this. I ended up buying the Storm Legion box, so that's on you. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful. The models look fantastic, and I've been having a fun time uh, taking them out. And I noticed there's much less assembly than I sort of expected. Uh, have you found? Has there been any pleasant surprises? I, I mean, I don't want to predict that this is easier than before. It's just, it just sounds like a lot of it's still challenging, just different challenges. But have you been pleasantly surprised at all with 3D printing? Is it giving you more options for different dynamic poses, more or less detail? Like, what is your feeling going forward? Like, we can do some things now that maybe we couldn't do before from just a model aesthetics. We can we can do things with the the 3D printing that you can literally only do with with uh, additive manufacturing, right? With right. with 3D printing, um, if you let's see, like one of my favorite examples is the the, uh, the Sea Raiders Tyrant, which um, I don't know if you've seen the model, if you're familiar with it, but it's it's the heavy war jack for the Sea Raiders. And it has these big like blades that come up over its shoulders and lots of like spiky bits. And if you took that same, that, that body, the Orgoth Tyrant body piece, which we now make as one piece, like that's the wow. body, the legs, everything except for the head and the arms that you you magnetize for the customization. That whole body piece is produced as one piece, but just the torso piece, which was a piece that we um, uh, man manufactured early on, mm. that would have been seven individual pieces in wow. traditional manufacturing. It might have, it probably would have been more if it was made in like hard plastic, right? You would have a whole sprue, right? You know, of, of pieces to to have to assemble there, and we're able to do that in in one piece. So. Absolutely. From the, from the assembly side of it, like if you're somebody who loves the assembly of miniatures and I have yet to meet that person, but <laughs> I was going to say, no, that's not love me. that. Right. <laughs> then this, then we're going the wrong way for you. Right. Because yeah. what we're doing with the, the 3d printing is more and more, we're finding ways to be able to reduce the, the, the part count to get super dynamic um, you know, poses or the incredible pass-throughs. Now you look at, if you look at the detail in the models, there's, you know, pass-throughs where things that would have had to be filled in before in, in traditional um, uh, casting or, you know, where we would have like pushed, like say um, an accessory, like a canteen or a, a, a grenade or something that might sit on somebody's torso. We'd push it in because, you have to watch out for those little undercuts, right? So everything right, right. 
you know, you can't create those areas where the molds are going to get stuck in between. That doesn't, you don't have that problem with 3D printing anymore. There's a whole other set of problems that we have to deal with. But with a different problem. That, right. But with that stuff, you know, we can, we can do these things. You know, you look in the, um, in the, like the, where different troopers or the, like, uh, there's certain characters in the Storm Legion box, right? The ones that don't have their helmets on. You look at yeah. Anson Wolf is a great example. Look at where his head sits inside of his collar. Right. Yeah. There's the that's impossible to do in any other Yeah, I noticed that on some of the bigger yeah. guys. The the um yeah, they're they're huge, the storm throwers and stuff that just look awesome. You're oh, right. Yeah. It's like the collars are the collars come up past their helmet edges, which which you don't really have to glue the helmet in. It's all one piece. It's crazy. It's awesome. Yeah, the storm throwers, the yeah. the the tempests guys. Tempest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um the they, you know, they're they're three pieces, the two arms and the body. Right. That was crazy. There, all in one yeah. piece. You can't even uh blew me away. And then as you know, you saw um the warcaster Debaro is one piece, right? Yep. Shield, lance, everything, all one piece. And um, and if you see when you see the uh the winter core starter box, every single model in that box is one piece. Right. So winter core is supposedly heading to his house as we speak. It's winging its so way from Seattle. So Matt, I want to be cognizant of time. I know I know you're taking time out of your busy day. We really appreciate it. Right. But um, Thank you, Matt, so much uh, for joining us today and spending time with us. And if people want to learn more about everything you guys are doing, it's it's over at privateerpresscock.com, right? Yeah. Yep. Always awesome. Awesome. Well, Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Achievement Unlocked. You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.